I'm Alex Green, and this is Stereo Embers, the podcast. Now, this is the point where I usually say, check this out, and I play you some music. But today, I'm not interviewing a musician. I'm interviewing a writer. So uh, I'm going to read their work to you, and then I'll tell you who it is, and we'll talk about it, and we'll get to the interview. Okay? Business as usual in a different kind of way. All right, let me get out my cello, and I'm going to play the cello while I read. Okay? (laughs) I'm not going to do that. Uh, That would be terrible. I'm just going to read the work. All right? Here we go. The sea surges through your house at Isla Negra, and the jackboots walk on water. Poet of cats and grapefruits, of elephant saints, poet of broken dishes and Machu Picchu, poet of panthers and pantheresses, poet of lemons, poet of lemony light. The flies swarm thicker than print on a page, and poetry blackens like overripe bananas. The fascists you hated, the communists you loved, obscure the light, the lemons with their buzzing. We were together on the side of light. We walked together, though we never met. The eyes are not political, nor are the taste buds, and the flesh tastes salty always, like the sea, and the sea turns back the flies. That is an excerpt from the poem To Pablo Neruda by my guest today on the program, Erica Jong. Let me tell you a little bit about Erica Jong. Erica Jong was born in New York City in 1942. It was the same year the Women's Coast Guard Auxiliary was established, the movie Casablanca premiered, and Albert Camus' The Stranger was published. All happy events for sure, but 1942 was also the year that the mass murder of the Jews at Auschwitz began. Not a pleasant place to begin an introduction, I know, but Erica Jong's body of work is haunted by the specter of the Holocaust, and its dark, ominous, and altogether gargantuan shadow is something she continuously confronts and grapples with in her writing, even to this day. Now, growing up, Zhang's father owned an accessory company known for making world-renowned collectible porcelain dolls. And her British-born mother, who was also a painter, had the job of designing dolls for the company. Zhang's family was steeped in the arts. Her grandfather on her mother's side was a portrait artist. Her mother had gone to the National Academy of Design, and her father was a musician. And speaking of music... Music became an enormous and influential component of Zhang's young life. Her father took the family to the New York Philharmonic every Sunday, and from Mozart to the blues, Zhang's childhood home was one where music was always on. Coming from such a creative and artistic home, it was no surprise that Zhang enrolled at the High School of Music and Art in Harlem. And just in case you were wondering, here are some notable graduates of the school— Billy D. Williams, Suzanne Strasberg, Kisses Paul Stanley, Myra Kalman, Laura Nero, and Slick Rick. Now, when she got to music and art, Zhang was already a voracious reader. She was a big fan, in fact, of Russian literature. But it was at this school where she began to hone her own skills as a painter, and her love of writing started to gain momentum. Zhang attended Barnard College, and it didn't take long for her to become the editor of the Barnard Literary Magazine. Not only that, but she also worked at Columbia University's campus radio station, hosting various poetry programs that she created. Now, Zhang's plan was to become a doctor and then write on the side. It's a practice that I refer to as William Carlos Williamsing it. But that was not to be. The more she studied with biographer James Clifford and poet Robert Pack, the more she found she could only think of herself in terms of being a writer. She graduated from college magna cum laude, got married, and then went to get her M.A. at Columbia in 18th century literature. It was there that she poured over works by Jane Austen, Mary Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft, and William Wordsworth. John got that M.A. in 1965, and a year later, she married her second husband, psychologist Alan Jong. Well, not second, like she was collecting them. She, you know, got divorced at that point. Just wanted to make that clear. Uh, Zhang put out two books of poetry, her debut, Fruits and Vegetables, and the follow-up, Half Lives. Of her debut book, James Whitehead of the Saturday Review gushed, 
Welcome, Erica Jong, and welcome the sensuality she has so carefully worked over in this wonderful book. Clearly, she has worked hard to gain this splendid and various and serious comic vision. Now, remember how I told you Jong was going to become a doctor? Well, she decided to be one again, only this time not a medical doctor, but an academic one. The plan this time around was to stay on at Columbia, finish her PhD, and immerse herself in professorial life. But halfway through the program, Jong decided to take a break and write a novel. Even though that made her 0 for 2 on the doctor thing, here's a spoiler alert, she made the right choice. That novel that she abandoned her PhD for was 1973's Fear of Flying. A literary tour de force of raw sexuality, worldly appetite, and dark humor, Fear of Flying was a sensation. Henry Miller called it a female tropic of cancer. John Updike raved about its brilliance. And everyone from the New York Times Book Review to Ms. Magazine sang its praises. To date, Fear of Flying has sold almost 40 million copies worldwide. Fear of Flying was seismic. It was like Nirvana's Nevermind and Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill and Liz Fair's Exile in Guyville, but all at once. It was more than a game changer. It was a game disruptor. And women all around the world recognized themselves in the book's protagonist, Isadora Wing. With Fear of Flying, Jong was articulating for women the desires, frustrations, and impulses that hadn't been articulated before. In 1993, Liz Fair may have written, I can feel it in my bones. I'm going to spend another year alone. It's fucking run. Fucking run. But it was Fear of Flying's frank, brutal, and comedic take on female sexuality that opened the door for Fair 20 years earlier. So, Jong followed up Fear of Flying with a 1975 poetry collection called Love Root. 1977 saw the release of How to Save Your Own Life, which was the sequel to Fear of Flying. 1979 and 1983 found Zhang publishing two more books of poems, and in between those, she had divorced Alan Zhang married writer Jonathan Fast, and given birth to her daughter, Molly. Jong divorced Fast in 1984, got remarried again, this time to litigator Kenneth David Burroughs, and more than 30 years later, things are going well. Over the course of a career that has spanned more than 50 years, Jong has published 11 novels, 7 books of nonfiction, and 7 books of poetry. She's the recipient of the Sigmund Freud Award for Literature and the United Nations Award for Excellence in Literature. She's a well-known speaker, giving talks on women's rights all over the globe, and she's a vocal supporter of the LGBTQ community. Erica Jong is a true architect of literature, and whether she's writing about female sexuality, the horrors of the Holocaust, or her own self-doubt, she does so with finesse, momentum, and muscle. Now, the plan was for us to talk about the vinyl reissue of Vanessa Dow's Zipless, songs from the works of Erica Jong, but we went all over the place, and uh, it was a blast. I love Erica Jong, and I think you're going to as well. So, here we are chatting it up, me and Erica Jong. Enjoy it right here on Stereo Embers, the podcast. Alex, how are you? I am well. How are you? Good. Glad I, to hear it. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you. I love Vanessa. Oh, I love her too. <laughs> I love Vanessa. She's an, an amazing, amazing person and so gifted in so many ways. You know, she's also a painter, a singer, um, a photography collector. I mean... I, there's no limit to her talents. She's like a artistic triathlete. Yeah, totally. I mean, she's really amazing. And, you know, when she was a Barnard, she was a writer and a painter and a singer. And it's amazing. We share that school, of course. But she was married to my nephew, Peter Dow. And the marriage came apart. But not before they did Zipless. <laughs> <laughs> She's um, really special, very uh, special. And I'm closer to her now 
than I am to Nephew Peter. Because Nephew Peter, as we always say in the family, flies under the radar. He's hard to get on the phone. He's quite cynical about life and people. Uh, and it's too bad because I always adored him. He's my older sister's second son. And, you know, my older sister has six kids. So there's Tony, who I'm very close to, and Peter, who I don't see enough of. But I adore him. You know, he's a great talent. And and then there's Annabelle and Maria and Chris and Jonathan. And honestly... I've always been closest to Tony, my eldest, and Maria, the second daughter. But I would love to know Peter better. Well, Peter has... He's he's hard to know. He was very artistic. I mean, he he had this amazing music and production career, uh, but he seems to have launched into a whole new milieu. Yeah, political career. And, you know, I think that... A friend of mine got him involved with Hillary, um, and he became her webmaster. And that led to a lot of things. And when Hillary was defeated the second time, it was terribly hard for him. Um, You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Really hard. My friend, who's now gone, a Barnard graduate as well, had a blog maybe one of the first political blogs ever done. And she knew everybody in politics. So I recommended Peter to her, and she in turn got him involved with Hillary, which was great. But when Hillary was defeated in in 2016, I think he went into despair because Trump was so unfit and it was so obvious that he was a traitor and completely corrupt and yet the people in the Midwest didn't see it. Now they do. Now they do, yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think, yeah, it's it's incredible. We in New York knew he was a con man. I mean, we all knew, you know, that's why nobody in New York voted for him. Well, he's been doing that since the early 80s. He's been doing it his whole life. Yeah. And he's gotten away with it because when his casinos collapsed, the Russian oligarchs came in to save him. And we know that. And we knew that before. None of it is news to us in New York. I mean, he has a building, Trump Tower, that he claims is 68 stories and it's 58 stories. He's, he lies about everything, and he's gotten away with it for a long, long time. I keep looking at the news, waiting to see him, you know, walked out of a out of a courtroom in cuffs. I wish it were so, but if you look at Nixon, uh, who did much less wrong than than Trump um, and Trump's crime family, um, Nixon went to New Jersey to a beautiful house in horse country and was on a law firm where they used his name for publicity. Um, He never went to jail. He should, but he didn't. Did you know that Nixon's approval rating when he left office was 25%? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I think I did. That seems way too high. It does. But, you know... We have a really stupid electorate because the Republicans, as I call them, are forever cutting the funding for education. And you remember that Trump said, I love the uneducated. Uh And that's always been, you know, the way they do it. They cut the funding for education. I mean, Betsy DeVos is, you know, criminally stupid. Um, and the way she got her job is that she and her husband owned a health care company, and they gave all the email addresses to the Trump campaign. 
it's all corruption. I mean, everything about his campaign and his presidency is corruption. And money. Money, money, money. So there you go. Let's talk about music. <laughs> Let's talk about music. <laughs> Uh, I will I will say one last thing about Trump is if they kick him out of office today, I'll, I still think it's two years too late. I think it's sick that they it would have taken that long. Well, it took that long with Nixon, two and a half years. Yeah. Um, and he had, you know, he had paid the burglars. He had he had done a lot of bad things. Not half as many as Trump, because Trump is is really a traitor. I mean, he has been plumping for Putin for two years. Witch hunt, witch hunt, witch hunt. Ugh. People are so stupid in this country. I don't think we'll, you know, ever get rid of the stupidity until we have a decent educational system. People don't know about how our government runs. They have no idea what the House of Representatives does. They don't understand gerrymandering. They don't understand that the Republicans, as soon as they get into office, get rid of voting rights for black people. And, you know, they disenfranchise anyone they can who they think won't vote Repug. Well, you know, I'm a professor out here in the Bay Area, and I see... You know, with 18 and 19 year olds, I can see exactly um, the lack of education, and it's shocking when they they come even to in me. the Bay Area, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh God, where? Yeah. What town do you live in? I'm just outside of Berkeley. Uh huh. God, I love Berkeley. I love Berkeley. They used to have the best bookstores in America. Do they still? There's many that are gone, like Cody's is gone, Black Oak Cody's is gone. Cody's is gone, uh-huh. and Black, what is it, Black? Uh, Black Oak Books is gone. Black Oak, I love that store. I know, that was a great place. And um, and then also, but Moe's is still there. Mm-hmm. I, my best friend from Barnard and Music and Art and Graduate School at Columbia <clears throat> moved to Berkeley. And so I used to come out all the time to see her. Now she lives on Cape Cod because both of her children are either in Boston or near Boston. So she moved out there, um, and she lives on the Cape because her son is in Boston and her daughter near Boston. But, you know, and she wants to be near her grandkids, which people do. But it's really, it's really sad. <sighs> I would have thought the Bay Area had good education, but I was wrong, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, I try my best, Erica. I, <laughs> I try my best. But what do you teach? I teach uh, critical thinking and composition at, at St. Mary's College. Yeah. And um, at which college? It's at St. Mary's College. And yes, um, you know, I always ask my students, "Do you like to read or write?" That's my first question, and the answer is always no and no. You're kidding? No. They don't read. They don't read. They just stare at devices That's all right. the time. That's right. Uh huh. Yeah, and um, and so there's a lack of uh, of you know critical thought and independent thought. And uh, they're very easily led. So I do my best. I have 12 weeks to, to break that in half, and it's, it's rigorous. Oh, God. How awful. I know. I mean, I think if people don't read, I mean, Trump's a perfect example. They can't really know anything deeply. Or even superficially, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, I mean, he doesn't know anything. You know, he'll go on television and he'll say, tariffs are easy, they work so well. And all the people who studied economics will be screaming, oh, no, they don't, right? That's right. And he believes he's, he's a genius because he's a narcissistic lunatic. And he believes he knows more than the economists. And he doesn't know anything. Yeah, he hasn't. He doesn't even know how to govern. He hasn't even. 
Well, that we know. I yeah. mean, he doesn't know how to govern. He has no idea what the branches of government are supposed to do or that the Constitution sees them as checks on each other. No fucking idea. None. None. And I... he doesn't. he doesn't want to know. No, no, because that would require thinking, which he can't do. And I, you know, I read an article on Obama from Harper's, and it was an article about how he was anguished for a year about what he didn't do in Syria. I mean, he was so circumspect and so thoughtful and so, uh, you know, just he spent so much time thinking about things. Well, uh, that was uh, why a lot of people hated him, you know. First of all, they hated him because he was half black, and because Trump managed to make them think he was born in Nigeria, which he wasn't. His father was. His mother was American. I mean, the whole insanity of how they got people to believe this through just lies. And it worked. And it worked. Yeah. It worked. It worked. Because, you know, his mother, who was a white girl from Hawaii, with white parents, who were quite thoughtful people, um, you know, fell in love with a Nigerian guest student and had Barack. Do you think anyone knew that? No. Mm-mm. I mean, it's shocking that they didn't, but they didn't. The fake news overcame the real news. Uh, it's really scary, I think. I hope there's a way out of this. Oh, we'll see. I mean, I don't, I don't think that any president, no matter how corrupt, and that includes Teapot Dome, has ever been sent to jail in handcuffs. I mean, we've had corrupt presidents, none as corrupt as Trump. And none, Nixon went to a fancy law firm and a house in horse country. And the president who was there during Teapot Dome had, had to pay back some money, but he didn't go to jail. I mean, it, we have never really sent any president to jail. I mean, Bush should have gone to jail for war crimes, and he's he's sort of just painting. Yeah, and know, Cheney, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Bush and Cheney. I mean, they both should have gone. And there are a lot of things we don't know about other presidents in terms of illegal wars and many, many things that I keep reading. I'm reading a book now, which I think is so amazing. Jill Lepore, who is a professor of history at Harvard and a writer for The New Yorker, has written a book called These Truths, A History of the United States. And it is one of the most amazing books I've ever read. And it should not be missed. Published by Norton, These Truths. And the line comes from, we believe these truths to be self-evident. Mm. And it's really a history of the United States, which goes back to our indigenous people. And it really begins, it really shows you how the race war began. The most shocking thing in the first few chapters is that the um, when the British came to America, the 13 colonies, there were more people of color in the United States than white people. And I read that and I said, how can that be? And she says that starting in the 15th century and the 16th century, the Portuguese slave traders were coming to the Caribbean and the southern colonies selling Africans to work the sugar cane. And it makes perfect sense because it makes perfect sense because the African, the only ones who made it across the Atlantic without dying of disease were the strongest and the most psychologically astute and the most survival uh, ready of the Africans because 
thousands of people were thrown overboard to be eaten by sharks, right? And then they came to America and they met Europeans who had smallpox, which decimated our indigenous population, that and killing them with pistols um, and rifles. And the African people who survived were the strongest. And there were many, many slave uprisings in the 17th and 18th centuries in the Caribbean and the South of what became the American South. So people, white people, had reason to be scared of Africans because they were the toughest of the people who got here. I had no idea that that, that was the case. N- neither did I. You know, and I read a lot of American history, and I studied American history at Barnard and in graduate school at Columbia. And when she said there were twice as many people of color um, as white people, when the British came, the British were the last to settle. First the Portuguese, then the Spanish, then the French, and the Dutch, and then the British last in the 18th century. And when they arrived, they were white, and they came to a country filled with indigenous people, so-called Indians, and black people, who often intermarried because there was an affinity between them. The Europeans who came here, yeah, they had made the passage across the Atlantic, But the Africans had survived the Middle Passage, which was horrendous. You know, I read a lot of the slavers' diaries when I was writing one of my novels set in the 18th century. It was horrendous. And the people who survived, the people of color who survived, were so healthy. They could survive smallpox. They could survive, you know, the abuses of the white people in the Middle Passage when so many black people were thrown overboard and even the shark patterns of the North Atlantic changed. That has been proven. So it's quite amazing. I've always wondered because you know, I, I'm Jewish and I, and I believe I believe we share that and I always wonder about those who survived the Holocaust. I wonder if that was just simply – uh, you know, a lottery-based survival, or if they survive because of... of um... It was, I mean, you've read Primo Levi's book. Oh, yeah. What I think about the Holocaust is that, in some cases, it was luck. I mean, Primo Levi was a, was a um, chemist, so they didn't kill him. But in some cases, it was luck, and in some cases, it was having the understanding to appear to succumb to the Nazis, and yet not. Because if you read enough Holocaust memoirs, you realize that there were some people who were smart enough to just keep their views to themselves. All the little children were murdered, by the way. Everyone. Everyone, because they didn't want to take care of them. And many pregnant mothers... I don't even want to talk about it. It's so upsetting. It's so horrible. I know. I just wonder about survival, and and uh, and. But what the that adults, does. it you know, if you were a chemist, they let they didn't kill you because they needed you, like Primo Levi. But you know, I don't know if you've gone to Yad Vashem in Israel, which is the memorial for all the children killed in the German Holocaust. My father was just there. Yeah, it's quite. Amazing, and there's a candle for each child snuffed. It's an amazing memorial. You walk in there, and every little candle represents a child killed. Oh, God. Yeah. You well, must go. I will. You must see it. It's really, of all the memorials I've seen in my life, including one in Berlin, which is very beautiful. Um. That one, Yad Vashem, is, 
is the most moving. They killed children, you know, like flies, basically. Anyway, so let's talk about music. Let's talk about (laughs) music. I mean, going from the Holocaust to music, not easy, but let's try it. Okay. Um, When Vanessa came to you with this idea Mm -hmm. and and she was telling me about the moment where she was going to talk to you about some changes that she had made so the songs Mm -hmm. would work – and I said to her, that must have been terrifying. Um, can you just remember that moment when she came to you? And what, what was I'm not thought? a terrifying person, okay, number one. I really am not. And if somebody comes to me and wants to adapt my work, whether it's a composer like Richard Daniel Poor, whom I worked on, on setting a bunch of my poems... Um, I'm not a terrifying person. I understand that another artist will not necessarily agree with my interpretation. And it would be stupid for me to insist on it. You know, like when I work with Richard, he says, I need to change this or it won't go with the music. And I understand that a poem is not an art song and an art song is not a poem. And so I will give him permission to rearrange the lyrics. And similarly with working with Vanessa, um, if she said to me, look, as a song lyric, this works better, it wouldn't be a surprise to me. And I would say, go ahead and do it. And also, I've always been very fond of Vanessa and Peter and... Um, and I knew they were super smart and very good at what they do. So I wasn't going to try to censor them. So there was trust and there was respect and there was also the art form that she was using for your right. work. Right. It's, it's different. You right. know, a song lyric is not a poem. A poem is not a song lyric. And I get that. But there is an intersection, right? Like so, like a lot of those, like Paul Simon songs or Leonard Cohen songs are anthologized in the Norton anthology, but they're also. God, I love Leonard Cohen. I know. You want it darker? Oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and it, I have seen the future. It is murder. I mean, I love Leonard Cohen. I think he's much, much better than any of his contemporaries, including the one who got the Nobel. Oh, that guy. Who was, yeah, that guy. What's his name again? <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, I think Leonard Cohen, you know, I mean, God, I am ready. One of his last songs, I'm ready, Lord. Um, Hallelujah. Amazing. Um, I just, I just think he's profound beyond anybody of that era. Did you cross paths with him at all? No, I wish. Yeah, I did not. It happens that I'm really good friends with Judy Collins, but and she knew everybody, of course, but. You know, I was in a different world. I was in literary world. I was in graduate school before that. And no, I did not meet Leonard Cohen. I wish I had. I think he was really amazing. He was, for me, so important because he was, you know, when I was writing poetry as an undergrad and he was writing about being Jewish and I I, I didn't know you could do that. Right. you know, and that was really liberating for me. It was so important to read that. So important. Very, very important. Um, Judy knew them all, of course. Um, Judy is amazing because her voice is so pure. And I think a lot of it has to do with not drinking for the last 50 years. She never damaged her vocal cords. She didn't smoke, she didn't drink. And there's a kind of purity to her sound that's extraordinary. And a fabulous writer. Fabulous. If only I could tell her that she ought to write more of her own songs, but she's concertizing all over the world all the time. 
Um, she supports her entire family by concertizing. She's always on the road. And she's in very good shape uh, emotionally and physically, and she works out all the time. She's nearly 80. Yeah, you can you can tell which artists have been hard on themselves and hard on their bodies, but you know at you know at a certain point it starts to to damage the the work. Damages the vocal cords. Yeah, you know, alcohol, uh, pot smoking, the the vocal cords can go. You can have polyps on your vocal cords, and um, there are certain doctors in New York who treat musicians exclusively, opera singers and pop singers, and I've met some of them, and their entire practice is about that. Yeah, you would think that your voice is something you would protect, um, you know, but sometimes when you're young, you don't realize you should. People don't. I mean, the shocking thing is, also, if you lecture a lot, you can hurt your voice. My daughter has now gone through a thing where she got a... Um, a flu from one of her kids and one of her vocal cords is damaged and she's gotten very political and she's on the board of the arena Democrats and all our candidates got into the House of Representatives. Wow. And um, the arena Democrat trains young candidates, um, young women of color, a lot of young men, um, and we got in all our candidates because I'm always called upon to give money. And Molly's on the board. And some of these young candidates are so incredible, you would not believe it. I mean, really. There's Lauren Underwood, who was a nurse for the Navy, I think. And she's now going to the House of Representatives. She's a woman of color. She's a trained RN. And she decided that she could do more for humanity entering politics. She's really amazing. And it's that kind of candidate they support, and they train them in speaking, and they train them, you know, and they support their campaigns. Very interesting stuff. Well, someone like Beto O'Rourke reminded me of like a punk rock uh, musician. Oh, Just, you know, I loved him. He could be president, you yeah. know. Could. He could. He's just amazing. And he could work the mic. He will He will go far, I believe. Yeah, he has that, that dynamism. What are some yeah. things that, that for writers, uh, in terms of self-preservation, it's a different demand than musicians? Uh, what are some things that are important yeah. to keep in mind? Well, writers are alone too much, and, and we all tend to drink too much or smoke too much dope. I don't smoke dope anymore because I lived in California during the time of Humboldt County, since <laughs> Amelia, and nothing compares to that. I lived in Malibu, and the, at the time that pot was around, and you can't smoke what they're serving now. It, it's different. It's, it's paranoia smoke, and I don't, I don't smoke, and I try to drink less and less. Really, the problem with writers is we spend too much time alone. Yeah, it's a solitary art. Very. And the best thing you can do as a writer is just write in the morning. Get up early, write in the morning, and at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, go play tennis or something. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're at your best. Most of us are at our best in the morning. Not everyone. You know, some people write all night. But, you know, I mean, I have one composer friend who writes all night and sleeps all day. Vanessa told me that she knew early on she was on her own planet as a kid. She she knew that. Right. Did you know that yourself about you? I knew I was on my own planet. But I have two sisters, one older, one younger. And we went through many periods where they um, both hated me. And now our parents are dead and we have had a rapprochement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. 
do you need me about the dinner? No, I'm just... Uh, okay. It's definitely 8 o'clock. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> So you, but you knew early on that you were that you were indeed in your own on your own planet. Maybe I mean I grew up in a family of painters, and my grandfather was a distinguished portrait painter, and I grew up in an extended European style family with my grandparents and my parents and my sisters. So, my grandfather painted on the third floor of our apartment in a huge studio with North Light. And I grew up thinking, how can you make a living if you're not an artist? Which uh, maybe was uh, not a good idea, but that was how I grew up. My mother was a painter. My father was a musician um, who later became a businessman. And um, he was a pianist and a drummer. So nothing ever, it never occurred to me that being an artist would result in starvation. (laughs) (laughs) Which is the opposite now. Right. Uh, Totally. So I didn't think there was anything weird, truly, because I went to the High School of Music and Art, now LaGuardia, and I painted throughout my childhood, and I went to the Art Students League and painted every Saturday and did still lives and life drawings and whatever. And it never occurred to me that there was anything weird about it because everybody in my family was an artist or a musician. So it just seemed like I was doing what they all were doing. My younger sister became a social worker in the field of addiction, Alcoholism runs rampant in my family. My um, older sister uh, painted beautifully, wrote beautifully, was an actor in college, and uh, married a Lebanese Christian, moved to Beirut and had six kids. She could have done anything. She was beautiful and talented. But she fell in love with the love of her life, and they moved to Beirut, and they never used birth control. (laughs) So I have six nieces and nephews, some of whom I'm very close to, two of whom I'm very close to. They're all in America now. They all had dual citizenship and left the Middle East. But, I mean, it never occurred to me that being an artist was a problem. Vanessa also, yeah. Yeah, Vanessa, she, exactly. I think it, for her, there really was no choice. That was, that was just right. natural. But Vanessa, you know she's a very talented artist. Yeah. She can draw. She has a great sense of color. She can write and she can sing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> she's amazing. And we've always had a bond, always, from the minute I met her. Do you think that that because you were both artists, that you sort of speak the same language and and you recognize that? Absolutely. I mean, from the time I met Vanessa, Vanessa and I went to the same college, Barnard. Right. And um, always loved her. And even though she and Peter are not together anymore, my older sister who's Peter's mother, adores Vanessa. And whenever Vanessa comes to New York, she spends a lot of time with my older sister, her former mother-in-law, and with me. And everybody loves her. She's, we're all crazy about her. And we know her better than we know Peter. I once heard Jerry Seinfeld say that he can only hang out with other comics because they, they understand the life that he's living. Do you feel that way about artists? Can you only hang out with artists? No, I couldn't talk to anybody. I have an ability to talk to anybody because I know that everybody has a story and wants to tell it. And I've spent great parts of my life listening to people's stories because I know that there is not a person in the world who doesn't have an autobiography they want to write. 
And I teach a course at Rancho La Puerta called How to Write the Story of Your Life, which I've invented just because I've discovered that everybody wants to write the story of their life. I listen to people. I mean, I've learned more about people from listening than anything. For you, is there, when, when Vanessa came to you with that music and you listened to her music, what was your take on, on that? Because that, was a, that probably wasn't music you'd, you'd heard before. Well, you know, I'm very open to all kinds of music, folk music, jazz. I love jazz. I love folk music. Um, and I, I grew up going to Leonard Bernstein's uh, lectures to children at Carnegie Hall. So music is not alien to me. As it happens, I don't play an instrument, although my parents tried hard to make me practice the piano. But we always had a Steinway in the living room because my father was a pianist and a drummer. We always had a set of drums in the living room, and my co my college and high school boyfriends would come over and play them. And we always went to concerts. So music is very much a part of my life. And I know that, you know, you can, you know, some people play the sitar and some people play the piano. And I'm a member of a group called Salon de Virtuosi in New York where you have musicians from every part of the world who come to play for us in small uh, spaces. And I love music, all kinds of music. So well, that was not hard. Yeah, because it's, it's such a groundbreaking album because it's so unique. It is unique. But they were, they were both very into the electronic sound and... My father was nuts about jazz. And, you know, given my druthers, I would sit in the bathtub listening to jazz artists on my uh, Alexa, right? I mean, I, I really like all kinds of music, some more than others. How is your personal discipline for, the, for your writing? How is it now? Are you as disciplined as you've always been? I'm pretty disciplined, but I get interrupted a lot by interviewers like you. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel terrible. Don't feel terrible. I'm kidding you. You should be laughing. <laughs> um, well, I also want to. I also want to promote you as well. And I know you have a new book coming out. I have a book of poems. The world began with yes, and it's um, it's a wonderful book. I think my best, but you know, one always feels that, and it it's got some of the best poems I've ever written, and they're quite recent over the last decade. And I've never stopped writing poetry because it feeds me. Um, poetry powers everything I write because I care about language and words. And um, and I love poetry. You know, if you are raised the way I was raised, with a lot of music, a lot of painting, a lot of schlepping to Europe to look at art galleries, um, a lot of jazz, a lot of folk, a lot of classical music, you know, you're open to things. I was very lucky. My mother was an artist. My father was a musician. And we were all exposed. You know, my mother used to drag us through the great art museums in Europe, and she would say, that was painted by a woman. That was painted by a woman. Women are unappreciated. She was a fierce feminist. So, I, you know, I've been, you know, given this. My parents were very neurotic and difficult, but they gave us a lot. Do you find, because I, I, I find that in, in my poetry, I don't find it, but in my nonfiction, I do. The, the Jewish identity comes out in my essays, but not in my poetry. 
Um, the Jewish identity, look, we are people of the book. There is no, if you look at Italian women writers, they're all Jewish. Every single one of them. Mm. Elena Ferrante, we don't know because we don't know who she is. But every other important woman writer in Italy has been Jewish. And there aren't that many Jews in Italy. But it, and they've been less killed than in any other country, by the way. And uh, the Italian Jews, you know, fewer of Italian Jews were killed than German Jews, Polish Jews, or any other Jews because the Jews arrived in Italy 2,000 years ago, and many of them lived in Rome, and they had close ties to the Pope and the Vatican. And, in fact, I have one friend, Alessandra Di Castro, whose family arrived in Rome 2,500 years ago. And the Jews in Rome have always had a much um, easier time. Some were deported by Mussolini, like Primo Levi. But, and there were some pogroms in Piemonte. But fewer Jews were killed in Italy than in any other country in Europe because of their association with the Vatican. Mm. It's really an interesting story. My my friend Alessandro Di Castro, who's an antiques dealer in Rome, has lectured at the Holocaust Museum and has written essays about this and how you may have noticed in the Roman Forum there is a carving, a bas-relief, of people carrying menorahs and they came from Jerusalem 2,500 years ago carrying menorahs so the Jews have been in Italy for a very long time and they mingled and intermarried with Catholics and they were treated differently from every other country what about the I think you and I have very similar roots I'm a, a Polish Russian Jew is my my background and I am 99% Ashkenazic ah okay where is the other 1% <laughs> <laughs> troglodyte possibly <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny because the, like, Polish-Russian literature, is, it's not that funny, but yet, you know, humor is such a huge part of our cultural legacy. Polish literature under the pen of Isaac Bashevis Singer mm. is pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is. He's um, pretty funny. I met him years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. How in was In Sweden. We were both autographing books in the same bookstore. He was very much a ladies' man. And I was very young and very blonde, and he noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I've always loved his his short stories enormously. One of my books comes out of one of his short stories, Seducing the Demon. There's a woman in one of his stories who tries to seduce a dibbuk. So he's had an influence on me. I loved his humor. It, in one of his novels, there are two men talking, and they know they're in Poland. I think it's called The Family Moscat. And it starts in the 19th century, and it goes into the 20th, and these two men are talking. And one of them says, perhaps death is the Malcolm of us the angel of death. Because they know the Germans are coming to invade Poland, and they know they'll be deported. And, um, you know, Singer was a Polish Jew with red hair and pale, pale skin. And um, he writes about the Polish Jews with Hitler invading. 
He's an amazing writer. He was incredible. I, for me, growing yeah. up, pe- people like Leonard Michaels or w- the early Woody Allen stuff or Saul Bellow, that to me was really funny. And I, and I, I identified with the humor and the darkness. Exactly. But that's Jewish humor. Yeah. Um, humor and darkness. Darkness and humor. Hope and despair. That's Jewish humor. You know, sleep faster, we need the pillows. Mm. It's one of the Jewish, um, you know, one of the Jewish jokes. It's not really a joke, but sleep faster, we need the pillows. Or, you know, let's laugh because they're coming to take us to the death camps. That's Jewish humor. And it's extremely madly funny. Woody has it. And at the same time, it's um, despairing. And the combination is what makes it so amazing. Hope, despair, despair, hope. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, Joan Rivers had such my favorite quote where she says, it shrinks the dragon. Exactly. It shrinks the dragon. Oh, she was great. I knew her a little. She was lovely. I loved her. She was brilliant. She was wonderful, and she was much maligned. Um, Johnny Carson had her on, was about to give her some shows. The network executives disputed it. She never got a break, and it wasn't until she was in her 80s that she had the chances she should have had. And she made them happen, really. Right. I I loved her because as she got older, she got better and better. And she better. got better, and she was more um, more loved because people got her humor. You know, when she was young, she was so radical that people didn't get it. Was she threatening, do you think? To men? Yeah. Yes. Not to me. I thought she was great. Do you find in your own work that you naturally go to humor? Is that a, a comfortable place? Yes, uh, it does. I mean, I do go to humor because, you know, let, let's laugh. They're going to send the Nazis pretty soon. You know, they're coming. Those guys, you know, who were at Charlottesville... Yeah. You know, don't let the Jews replace us, which is very funny because Jews are two tenths of one percent of the world population. We couldn't replace anybody. And they're afraid that we're going to replace them, mostly because they're all so stupid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're yeah. two tenths of one percent of the world population. Do you realize how small that is? Yeah, and and they somehow give us credit for controlling things as well. (laughs) Right, exactly. I mean, it's like a joke. It is a joke. Um, And we supposedly control the stock market and the World Bank. I mean, it's because so many Jews are so ambitious and so smart. I mean, really, I mean, you, you look at I mean, we're sort of like we all have tiger mothers, like the Chinese in America. Our tiger mothers won't let us shut up. I mean, we have Jewish mothers, and everything you got to achieve, you got to achieve. If you don't achieve, you know, you don't deserve to live. Right. That's right. The Jews have been maligned. The Holocaust was just, you know, that was a recent event. But, I mean, for hundreds and thousands of years, we've been maligned and persecuted. If you read Simon Shama's book, The Jews of the Ancient World, you see the pattern repeating itself. The Jews come into a town, could be Goa in India. They come in sort of naked and poor. In four generations, they amass tons of money, they run the government, 
they're very successful in trading and business in the arts. And then the Inquisition comes and picks off the most, the richest and the most talented and the most powerful and burns them at the stake. Uh. It happens again. And again. you have to read Sam and Shama, the Jews of the ancient world. The pattern, you know, it could be Hitler. And it happened again and again and again in every country the world over. Not in uh, not among the indigenous peoples of North America and South America, but everywhere else. And I worry. I worry it'll happen again. Well, it, it could. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> That's not very cheery, but... It, but... <laughs> no, but it's true. I mean, Simon Shama is very good on this. He also gave a bunch of lectures on it on BBC that were shown here. And he lives here now, but he's very, very good and a terrific broadcaster as well as writer. I have not read the book. I need to read it. He's really good. I mean, he's really good. He also wrote a great book on the French Revolution called Citizens, Citoyen. And I've read many books on the French Revolution because I have a novel that's set during the French Revolution that I haven't finished and um, it's really interesting. It's an interesting period in history. Is that a, a book that has been sort of uh, in process for a while? It's a book about um, Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun, mm. the portrait painter. And she fled the French Revolution right after the Bastille fell. And she made her way to Italy and then eventually to Moscow. And she stayed away from Paris for years, painting all the crowned heads of Europe, Naples, Moscow, everywhere. England, she hated England, as most French people do. She didn't stay there long, but she stayed in Moscow for a long time and painted the Romanovs and everybody. But then... Um, when the revolution was completely over, she went back to Paris. And sadly, her kind of painting was out of fashion. She lived to be in her late 80s. But she had been the toast of the town, and now Delacroix and other painters had become fashionable. So she lived in Paris, and people thought of her as an old lady whose style was no longer interesting because she had painted the Bourbons. Um, but she survived. Her daughter did not, but she survived. And the person who took care of her in her old age was her, her niece. It was it. It's an interesting life, and I will finish the book sometime. But I abandoned it because the life of a painter is not very exciting. She's standing behind a canvas most of the time, and I wanted to figure out a way to, you know, get her involved with spies, and and I hadn't found the right way yet. Is it hard to walk away from a book and say I'll let that marinate? For however long it you takes. have to let it marinate you know some books you, it's like turning the picture to the wall you know you have to because you're not ready yet and then you know you, one day you wake up and you think oh I know how to finish that it's it's really you know you have to be able to do that so there's like artistic di sort of artistic distance that you need to Often, yeah. yeah. Well, I hope so, you, I hope you finish. Where it. are we now? Are you? Do you have enough material? <laughs> you're, you're very kind to talk to me this. I appreciate your, your, your talking to me this long. Well, I clearly, you need to write the story of your life, and I teach that course. You do, you do. <laughs> oh, and and also you're doing the the Pussies Grab Back book as well. Right. Yeah, and that's not ready. 
because my stupid agent showed it to my publisher. And they said, well, we love Erica, but it's not ready. And it wasn't. <laughs> so... <laughs> Your agent got excited. She got excited, and the publisher said, we're very excited. My agent got excited about the advance, as agents do. Well, uh, by the way, you seem like, <laughs> like you probably had the same friends. Uh, you're very, you seem very loyal, Erica. Really? Yeah. Uh, I do. I have many, many friends from my youth. Yeah. Some. I mean... Last night, I have to tell you, I went to a party for my professor of Italian literature at Barnard and Columbia, who is now turned 99. And it was an amazing experience because I saw people from college and graduate school I haven't seen in years. And it was amazing. And my husband, who was tired and stayed home, tried to reach me on the phone, and I didn't hear the phone ring. There were so many people. And I got home. I thought I'd be home by 8 o'clock, and I got home at 9.30, quarter to 10. And he said, I was calling you. You didn't answer. And I said, if you had been there, you would have seen how many people there were. I didn't hear anybody call. And a lot of the people were people I knew in college and graduate school, and it was amazing. First of all, they all look so old. And the women who haven't had any work done look terrible. Just terrible. And the women who stopped working out and the men who stopped working out look terrible. Um, and they're staggering around on canes. Oy. And... It, you know, I went to school a long time ago. I graduated from Barnard in 63. I published my first novel in 73, my first book of poems in 71. And these people look quite decrepit. <laughs> <laughs> this summer I'm going to a music and art reunion, and for the first time in my life I fear it. <laughs> Was that, was that a decentering experience? What, what were you expecting? Well, my my professor, who we were celebrating, has reached ninety nine. Right. So I didn't expect her to look like a spring chicken. <laughs> However, there were many people from graduate school and college who practically looked ninety nine. I got to write about that. <laughs> In my family, we look young for a long time, but um, this is not true of a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I started looking older very young, so I think I, I've aged okay. Cause How I, old are you now? I'm Alex. 48. Yeah, and do you have your hair? I do. Amazing. Yeah. That's already something. Yeah. Yeah, but the, right? but the the California sun was not kind to my skin, so I think I started looking older in my early twenties. Well, yeah, you need a hat. Get a hat. Get a hat. <laughs> no, my father, my father, who was very, very handsome, and loved Peter because they were both pianists, right? And my father never wore a hat, and he developed a precancerous condition on the top of his head. And I remember taking him to the hospital to have this precancerous skin taken off and where his hair was thinning. And they took it off, they got it, and ever after he wore a hat. <laughs> 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 he was very, very handsome and quite vain. So wear a hat, that's all I can tell you. Uh -huh. I will. I appreciate that. <laughs> Put no sunblock on your face, <laughs> which men hate to do. Yeah, but in California, you have to. Right. My darling husband will not put sunblock on his face, and he's had precancerous lesions, you know. 
So there you go. And by the way, one last thing on, on this reunion of sorts. Uh, there's no mm-hmm. harm in getting a little work done, right? Right. I mean, if you have to do it, you do it. Right. What's the big deal? Right. Exactly. But do wear a hat. I will. Okay. I will. <laughs> I thought it was funny that my father, after having this precancerous thing on the top of his head, never took off his hat. <laughs> it was too late, right? But he never took it off. Yeah. He had, like, PTSD from it. Right. He was funny. I mean, it was funny. <laughs> so do you have kids? I do not. Do you have a wife? I did, but I don't anymore. Okay. And... Are you planning to get another one ever? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm trying to find one that uh, that likes me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that would be good. You don't want to marry anybody who doesn't like you. No, uh, I want to. Find... No. <laughs> well, I did That's the first. Very time. funny. Yeah. This is very funny. Yeah. You should marry someone who likes you if you're going to do it. I've just written this thing for an editor at New York Magazine about. First marriage, second marriage, third marriage, and fourth marriage, mine. And my fourth marriage was unquestionably the best. But my third marriage gave me my daughter, which was good, too. My first one was terrible. Yeah, well, they're supposed to be. They're called starter marriages. (laughs) And they're supposed to be terrible. Because you're not mature enough to know what you need or what you really want. But really, I swear to you, this is true. Starter marriages are like a seasoning for the rest of your life. And after that, you know more what you want and who is kind and who's a bitch or bastard or whatever. And this is true of straight people and it's true of gay people. And my my coach is just marrying his partner of 25 years. He's a former dancer who invented a new career for himself, and he's marrying his uh, partner of 25 years who's a child psychiatrist. And they had great trepidation about getting married, and now they're doing it. How old are they? Mostly you? because, well... Terry is 48, okay. and John is about 47 or 50. I'm not sure who the older is, because I've only met John briefly. But Terry, who's a French-Canadian, is one of the smartest and nicest people I've ever met, and I train with him twice a week. We lift weights, we do yoga, we do cardio, we do whatever. And, um, you know, we see each other twice a week so we confide in each other about marriage. And gay marriage is no different from straight marriage, it turns out. Yeah, you you have to be with the person. You have to actually spend time with the person and like them. Right. It's not any different. I mean, there are gay people who are promiscuous, and there are great gay people who are not, and there are gay people who, you know, go to the baths and screw other people, and then there are people who would never dream of doing that. And they're not any different from straight people, it turns out, which I didn't know because when I was younger, I knew a lot of gay men who fooled around that was before AIDS and they did a lot of fooling around and then after AIDS everybody became celibate yeah they were ter- <laughs> terrified um, right and you know so I lived through all that stuff well I'm happy to hear that my my first marriage wasn't a waste of time because it sure felt no like your it. first marriage was not a waste of life time first marriages are always terrible well i hope i get it right i mean how old were you when you met this person i got married i think at 40 at 40 okay and you're now 48 i'm now 48 okay so you'll look for the right person i think 
I hope so. I, I hope you're right. My money is on you. Oh, you're sweet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen. You want to marry somebody who you laugh with, who likes having sex with you, and you like having sex with them. You Somebody who admires you and whom you admire. Somebody who even when they fuck up, you love. Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds exact. There's my new personal ad. Right. I don't know where you find them. I was fixed up with Ken, my fourth husband, by friends. I had never been on a blind date before. Yeah, where, do you, where do you meet people these days? I guess you just have to meet I have them. no idea because I've been with Ken for now 30 years. I have no idea where people meet. I know that people go on J-Date. Yeah. My my daughter met her husband on J Date and they've been together fifteen years and they have three kids and they seem to still like each other. So it works. It might. And it might not. I don't know. <laughs> I'm no, report. but I, w- I would certainly try it. I will report back. I, I hope it goes okay. well. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I wish you well. I appreciate that, Erica. Thank you so much for talking to me. You're so welcome. Take care, sweetie. She has a great laugh, that Erica Jong, doesn't she? Great conversation. We were all over the place, but somehow it all made sense. Uh, You know what really makes sense? Going to ericajong.com. You know why? Because everything you need to know about Erica Jong is there. That's why. Tour dates, media appearances, conferences, old books, and new books, they can all be found on ericajong.com. As for me, you can find me at alexgreenonline.com, or you can follow me on Twitter, at Ember's Editor, or join me on Instagram, Ember's Podcast, or you can email me at editor at stereoembersmagazine.com. What more do you want? My social security number? My God, that's so many places to get a hold of me. All of those should work. Uh, okay, uh, if you want me to book a guest on the show that I haven't talked to yet, use that email I just gave you, editor at stereoembersmagazine.com, and I'll do my best to track that person down. Now, I thought I'd close the show today with a song from Vanessa Dow's Zipless album. Remember, the album is an interpretation of Erica Jong's work, and this is one of the songs. This is The Long Tunnel of Wanting You. Enjoy it, and I will see you next week for another episode of Stereo Embers the podcast this is the long-